And is everyone there? Uh, were there any prayer sheets or anything? Okay. Uh, if, if anybody doesn't need one, they're back there. And um, we've got a note right here. Welcome to whoever's on uh, watching on live stream. We're glad you're with us. Don uh, Peskin, remember him? His wife was in the hospital, and, and um, now he's going back in on Friday. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Going back in on Friday because he's having some atrial fibrillation in his heart, and so let's let's be praying for him, and uh, continue to pray for him and his family. Okay, uh, Lindsay, tell me the first name again. Dan Lindsay. Okay. Oh, that's fine. Any other prayer requests that we need to address other than what's on our... Gary Tucker's brother, uh, yes. Jeff Tucker's brother, Gary, right, is improving and he'll be going home soon. And we're thankful. Start to get the uh, symptoms figured out. Jessica, surgery went well. She's at home. Well, well, I've never been told that. Okay, that's why I want to put my head down. All right, anybody else? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing upon these requests and upon our time tonight together. Father in heaven, we love you and thank you and give you praise for who you are. Thank you for the rain, Lord. We certainly need it. We want you to care over, over all of us as we are out and as we have to be out in this, uh, in this weather. That you would... Uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would meet every need on this prayer list and those we've mentioned tonight. Father, we just ask for your guidance and direction in each of these. Healing where healing is needed, and we ask for your guidance. And uh, Father, we, we just give you praise that you hear our prayers. Now bless our service tonight. Bless us together as we study your word. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Hello. Hello. <laughs> It's working. <laughs> you, you just... You did it. It's, you it did. worked for me earlier. It's your fault. <laughs> okay, can you hear me any better now? I thought you could hear me before. but uh, All right, we're in, um, we're in Habakkuk. We're going to go into the final chapter. And we're probably going to do this in two, two uh, times together because... Um, uh, I'll be here again the, in about two weeks to fill in for the pastor, and so I'm, I'm going to break this down and kind of make it into two sessions. But as we kind of kind of recall about Habakkuk, and when we started several weeks ago, a couple of months ago, when I started filling in, Habakkuk was was one of these prophets who God didn't send so much as he went on behalf of Israel to find out what was going on with um, the things that were going on in Israel and why God hadn't taken action. It, it, it wasn't, he, he was perturbed with Israel. He was perturbed with what he saw. He was perturbed and, and upset with all the sin that was going on. And he finally went to God, to, as we found out in chapter 1, 
why are you allowing this to happen, and what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Don't we feel like praying that sometimes, uh, even here, and uh, uh, not only in our country, but as as I go around and uh, I've preached in a lot of churches, been a lot of places, and there's many times I'd come home and say, Lord, why are you allowing that to go on? The things that, that I see and some of the stuff you hear in our day and time. And so that's what Habakkuk did. He wanted to know why Israel had gone so far, why the sin had gotten to such a level that um, he really felt like God needed to do something. And God, in his mind, wasn't. And he wanted to find out what and why. And so as we, as we realized, God came, gave an answer back to Habakkuk and said, yeah, um, I know what's going on, and judgment's going to come. And he gave him a little insight as to what that judgment was going to be. He said, there's a group out here, and, and I want you to pay attention to this, because sometimes we don't really feel like God does anything with the nations of the world. The Bible says he knows every act that's, that's ever taken from anybody any nation, any, any person. He knows what's going on. And here in Habakkuk, we realize that God not only knows what's going on, he will deal with nations that aren't Israel and that aren't, quote, unquote, his people, but he will deal with what the nations do and what they have done and what they are doing. And as we'll find out later on in, in this chapter, uh, God doesn't change. And so uh, and that's, that's an important statement, that, that there's no variation of turning with God. When he, when he has declared something, it's going to happen, whether it's back in Habakkuk's day or if it's in our day. If he declares something is, is sinful and wrong and, and we're involved in it, or if we're den- denying him or just rejecting him or ignoring God, uh, there's a penalty to pay for that. And I think we're paying some of that today. I think America is paying some some penalties about some things, but we can get into that at another time. But uh, so in in chapter 1, God gives them a little insight about this bunch called the Chaldeans. And he said they're a ruthless bunch. They come in like wild horses and they trample everything that that they uh, come in contact with. And uh, they're they're just really the word would be obscene in the things they do. They 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 not only conquer, they destroy and they plunder and all those things uh, that uh, is going to happen to Judah, going to happen to Israel. And then in chapter two, remember we you know, we kind of got into the fact that. Um, Habakkuk went through uh, the the five woes that are mentioned, that God's going to, uh, you know, woe means in, in Scripture sudden destruction. When when God pronounces a woe on something, it, it, it simply means sudden destruction. I mean, it, it may not happen the next day, but when it does happen, it'll happen quickly. And I, I guarantee you one thing, it'll be complete. Um, God doesn't fool around. If you remember in chapter 2 when, when we were talking and it, uh, Habakkuk was getting his answer from God, God said, this is the answer. And around, chapter, around verse 2 or 3 or somewhere right around there, he said, this is the message and I want you to make it plain. Don't go out there and try to sugarcoat it. Don't go out there and say, I say one thing. And, you know, and as, as we so often hear today, you know, the Bible says one thing, but somebody get up and preach and say something else. You know, God didn't really mean this. He meant this. Well, I believe God said what he meant and meant what he said. I believe God's always said what he meant and meant what he said. And God can always reverse. You remember Hezekiah. You know, Hezekiah, you're, you're going to die and not live. And he sent a prophet to talk to him about it. But he did extend his life. He extended it 15 years. So God, God has a right to change his mind. But Hezekiah still died. It was just later. And God's mercy was invoked there. But um and God, God can do whatever God wants, but I, I, I can promise you if God says that there's going to be punishment for something that you're doing or something you should be doing or uh, whatever, when, when judgment comes, it will come. And when it does come, it will be absolutely complete. In chapter 2, we talk about the five woes. The first woe was for plundering. Uh, like when Chaldea would come in, they, they not only conquered, they not only... Do, you know... I like history. I, I like military history. I like um, I like studying about uh, uh, conflict and wars and things. And overwhelmingly, with all of our faults and failures, the United States of America is one of the few 
countries and, and one of the few that does it totally. When, when we go in and, and conquer or win a battle, then we turn around and rebuild the things that we destroyed for the people that we've had destroyed. Um, I believe that's why we've been blessed and great. We, you know, a lot of people get caught up in war. And we could just shrug our shoulders and say, too bad, you know, your country shouldn't have done what it did. But so much in Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, um, we would destroy, have to. Then we go back in there and build it back up, build a school, build homes or whatever. Um, uh, God's saying about Chaldea, they don't do that. When they plunder, man, it's complete. They're going to come in. They're going to take your homes. They're going to take your money. They're going to take your children and your wives. They're going to take your, your cattle. They're going to take anything of value. And everything else, they're going to leave in the dust. It, it's just horrible. And and they don't do it. it uh, God had said in chapter 2, it's, it's not just that they do it, but with the vengeance and the joy they do it with. It's it's an evil unto itself. It's It's just... I call it beyond the pale of even even bad people. They, they just love what they do. They they love, and then they get other nations involved, and then those nations will help them plunder, and then they'll turn around, right around and plunder the nations that helped them plunder the other nations. They, they just love that. And God said judgment's coming. The first woe was on plundering. The second woe was on coveting for evil gain, and what, what I just discussed. Uh, they would destroy everything, take everything they wanted and destroy everything else, leave nothing for anybody, and most of the time destroy the population as well. The third woe was because of their because of their just intense violence. Well, you say, preacher, violence is violence. Yeah, violence is violence, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a difference between stabbing somebody one time and stabbing them 116 times. Uh, you know, there's a difference, and I'm not saying one's better than the other or worse, but uh, vengeance can really, I, I, I worked in hospitals, uh, I worked in emergency rooms, I was a deputy marshal, and I'm telling you, I've seen about the worst man can give, and, and this was out in the country, much less go to New York or even here in Lynchburg and some other places where things not only are violent, they're just vicious. You know, it didn't, I was protecting myself, or it didn't, I shot this guy, you know, because he was doing something. But it's, it's the viciousness by which they do it. And God sees that and looks at that. And, you know, um, hurting somebody is one thing. Just devastating them is something else. And continuing to do it is just absolutely un unbelievable. And God said he, he's going to bring judgment on that, on that third woe. The, the fourth woe was the results of their drunken immorality, and it was more than just um, the things they did. I wouldn't even begin to describe as far as what some theologians believe uh, that was involved. You, you can imagine. You know how man... Uh, the, the the lust and things of man, not not only, I mean, of course, sexual sins and all that, but lust for everything. It, it was just a, you know, when they did it, they did it with great gusto. And God said that, that that's going to be dealt with. They're, they're, it's not just that they wanted something and got it, but it was just the, the veracity by which they came and took it. And then, of course, the fifth woe was idolatry. And the thing of it here, he wasn't just talking about Judah here. He's talking about the nations of the world because it says he's going to judge all the nations. All of them are going to take into account because, you know, I don't know how to explain all this except for one thing. Uh, Romans reminds us when they're talking about salvation, about God and the affairs of God, that people, Paul said, listen, people are going to stand without excuse. Yeah, but they've never heard the God. They never know anything about Jesus. Yeah, but nature itself teaches that, that there's a God. You can't look at nature. You can't look at the stars. You, you can't look at the things going on and not understand. You can say it like the pastor did the other day. You know, you, you, you can say that you can put everything together, shake it up, throw it up against the wall, and it'll come out, uh, you know, a Belgian watch or, or take paper type and all that and put them together and throw it against, and it all comes out as, as paper printed and folded. It doesn't work that way. We don't have chaos in the universe because we, we had a God who, who did it uh, with, with great uh, precision and, and great understanding. And that's why, um, uh, you know, the, you, billions of light years away, and I don't know how they know all this. I, um, you know, the last thing I heard, you know, the Bible says in 104, you saw that God threw the stars in the sky and he calls them by name. Well, we have no idea how many stars are out there. They, they say there's a 40, 100, 
and what a hundred million I mean a hundred yeah hundred and four hundred million in the Milky Way galaxy that, that and, and that's our galaxy that's our little teeny galaxy compared to the, some of them are 15 times that large they, they say but the greatest guess that computers can come up with the last thing I read it's been several months ago that they're they're in in the galaxy is what they can understand there's a billion trillion stars that's a billion stars a trillion times well how do you count that I mean you know personally I think they're wrong I think it's nowhere near, I think it's far beyond that Be, because God's greater I mean he you, you just no way you, you can estimate of what's out there and somebody would say well why if there's nothing else out there no other uh, human-like creatures or life why did God do that well uh, first of all because he's God <laughs> he can he does he, he can do big things but I believe and this is just a personal opinion I believe it's just because you know they even say the universe is still growing and, and they can tell from from years ago taking re readings over here and over and and then it's beyond that now it's been, and they're wondering why well you know why I believe I, I just don't believe this universe can hold his glory I think it just has to keep expanding because God's glory is so great his power is so magnificent and that's not the message for tonight but, but anyway all these things are coming about because God said he was going to judge nations he, he was going to judge this he's going to judge every nation for what they've done and yeah, he said, well, you know, what's that got to do with salvation? Well, not, nothing except for the fact that God created this world to worship and praise him. And they've turned their back and there's no, and they're not going to be able to stand with him. You know, in, they, they certainly couldn't back then and, and they're not going to be able to in the, in the days to come and say, well, Lord, we never knew you. We didn't know who you were. We, we, we worship this God or we worship this God. Well, that's going to be one of the woes, the, the idolatry. You would rather listen to a wooden object like this stand right here. We can make it a God and bow down to it. Uh, but does it talk to you? Does it give you instruction? Does it help you? No. Isn't it silly for man to do that? Of course it is. But we have, we have placated ourselves into the fact that this is what we need to do because we need some guidance, but we'll just get it from a wooden stool instead of the living God. And, we just, and so God said that's what they're going to be judged for. Okay, with all that said, we come to chapter 3, which is the prayer of Habakkuk. And starting with verse, and I don't know how far I'll get here, so whatever we don't get, we'll get the next time around. And I, I apologize for not having the little sheets. I, I forgot. <laughs> forgot to, so I'll give them to you next time. You can fill in and, and, uh, and uh, keep everything up to date. But here, here's the prophet's prayer beginning in verse chapter 3 and verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet on Shigioneth. Um, now, let's get that out of the way right now. There's a lot of people. Don't, most Bibles will say on the bottom or, or in your concordance. We don't know what that means. And... Some of them don't. Some theologians believe, though, it has to do with a musical note um, because this verse, this, this prayer here is written almost like a musical uh, prelude or inter interlude or prayer or whatever it is. Say, well, why would they do that? Well, be, because music often makes you stop and think and music often, and you'll see the word sila in here two or three times. And that's because it's a musical pause. But that's not a musical pause just to stop the music. It's a musical pause that indicates stop and think of what you just said. You know, stop and think. It's good. You know, the Bible says that Mary, when she heard about Jesus and learned, of course, she, she knew who her son was. But as, as he grew and she saw things, what's the Bible say? And Mary pondered these things in her heart. It was a sila. It, it, it was a stop and think about what she had just observed. And then there was a lot to observe, wasn't there, with Mary? I mean, my goodness, can you imagine? Well, we need to stop and observe and think about what the Bible says. It doesn't hurt us as we read the Psalms and the Proverbs or wherever God, I mean, you may take you. Stop as, as you're reading something and a thought hits you. Stop and think about it. Just stop and let it, let, you know, I hate to use the term. like It's like a cow chewing its cud. Well, that to me, I've watched cows chew the cud. That's not fun to watch. But what it does, you bring it up and think about it again, you know. Uh, so chew over it <laughs> if, that, if that helps you. Chew on it a little bit. Um, think about it because, first of all, you'll remember it. And second of all, it'll be 
health to your bones. It'll be health because you're thinking on the very word of the living God. And uh, we, need to, we need to think about these things. We, we need to keep our minds on these things. And so Shigianoth is probably something, uh, you know, I, I think maybe Habakkuk here, even though he knew what was coming, he was a little bit excited that God was going to do something. I don't think he was real excited about what he had heard, but he, he knew God was going to do something. Um, look, at, um, look at verse 2. Oh, he says, oh, Lord, I have heard your speech. I heard what you said back in chapter 2. I've heard your speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Now, that's an important statement because Habakkuk begins his prayer. He acknowledged what God had said. Hearing what God had said made him a little afraid. But let me tell you something. When God, can you imagine Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai when that mountain began to tremble a little bit? I'd, I'd be a little afraid. Yeah, you know why? Because you're you're dealing with God, but it, it it's also the kind of fear that puts you on your knees and calls out to Him, and uh, and and God, and ask for His guidance and ask for His mercy. I think sometimes we've gotten over the fear, don't don't you? Sometimes I think I think the church and people have well, well we're, we're safe in God. No, I, we're we're supposed to fear Him for who He is, because He's God. And we should be on our faces, for first of all, giving him praise, but understanding who we're dealing with. We're not dealing with the man upstairs. No, we're dealing with the man in here because he came down to us. And he, he came to us and, and, and provided a way out, just like uh, I think he will for Israel even here, even though judgment is coming. Uh, he, he, the prophet's hope here went far beyond Judah. He, he knows Judah's about to be uh, judged. God already said there, it's coming. But Habakkuk, he said, you know, I got a little afraid. But then he turns right around and he said, Lord, revive your work. In the midst of all this, God, in, in the midst of all this, I know who you are. I know how great you are. Do your work. Because Habakkuk knew in the long run, God doing his work would mean more than if he did nothing at all or just let him have a pass. Um, God said, do, uh, Habakkuk said, do your work, uh, let, let it do. But as he said, in the midst of the years, make it known, but in wrath, remember mercy. As you're going to let the wrath fall, you need to. You said you would, but let your mercy fall too. Don't, don't forget us. Don't wipe us all out, you know, and God never will wipe out Israel. There will always be a remnant. Don't wipe us all out, but remember your mercy, even though we're, we deserve what you're going to give us. But remember your mercy. Can you imagine how many times Israel has seen the mercy of God, um, especially even coming up out of Egypt, you know, God's mercy. Um, they, 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 they disobeyed the Lord. You know, they wouldn't go into the promised land because they got afraid of the big giants of Anak and all these. And then Caleb comes up and says, well, this ain't no bunk. Go back to what Numbers thirteen. Uh, this is no problem. We can go in there and take that land. God's provided for us. Let's just go. And everybody said, "No, no, no, no." You know, uh, yeah, but they got these big escrow grapes in there, big as you know. Get in there, and you can, it takes two guys to carry a thing of grapes. Let's get in there and get no. We're not going up against these guys. Well, wait a minute. God brought us out of Egypt. All the Egyptians gave us all their gold. Because God said they would. We came to the water and we were stuck when he, Pharaoh's armies were coming. He opened up the Red Sea. He opened up the sea and we marched through on dry ground. Then he closed that back up and, and killed all of them. Um, you know, there's been a lot of things going on. What's the problem here? You know, what's going on? Why, why can't we go in there and take the land? Oh, it's just too much. It's just too much. You know, I, I've seen them. Uh, you know, yeah, but how easily we forget. And that's what Judah did. They forgot God. They forgot his majesty. They forgot his power. And he's warning us. Let me tell you something. If there's ever a woe pronounced on you, hit, hit, hit your knees. <laughs> you know? Because God, God is true to his word. God is true. Um, uh, when he says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. So he, he, uh, he pleads for God as, 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 he, as he brings his wrath to please Lord Remember your mercy. And he, he will. 
in years to come. Uh, Israel will still be around. They're not going to be totally annihilated. Um, but, you, but you do remember when they were in the wilderness 40 years, the, that generation, not one who, who said no about going into the promised land, ever went into the promised land. Not one. And uh, you remember what? They tell us that there's probably um, two and a half million or, or more Israelites that came out of Egypt and so on. I mean, it wasn't just a few. It was a bunch. And uh, by the time everything, plus all their cattle and all that, and then they got out there where they didn't have any water, and, and, and Moses struck the rock, as, you know, as God told him to speak to the rock, or struck, and the water came out of nowhere. Um, folks, God's reminding us, I don't care what your circumstances are and how bad they may look and, and, and how faithful you are to him. Sometimes we, get our, we, we just walk into bad problems because the world's a bad place, and they don't like us, and they don't want us. And God may walk, be walking you down a path you're thinking, oh, no, you know. Be faithful to the Lord. He's faithful to you. He'll provide the drink when you need it. He'll provide the manna when you need it. He'll pro- God said, look, you were in the wilderness 40 years, and your, and your jackets never wore out. Your shoes never wore down. You had cl- 40 years. I can't wear shoes I bought at Walmart. That's about two months. <laughs> you know, 40 years. God's gracious. God is good. And especially when we think there's no help coming, help's always there. How do you know? I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Isn't that wonderful? We serve a wonderful God. All right, anyway, look at verse 3. He says, God came from Teman, the Holy One from the Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. Now, I heard somebody say one time many years ago, I don't know who he was, said Teman, you know, God, God came from the hills of Teman, because Teman meant nowhere, so God came from the hills of nowhere, for there was nowhere for God to come from. Well, theologically, that's probably true, because um, God has always been. There's nowhere to come from. He just is. But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the hills of Teman. <laughs> Teman's a real place, down next to Edom, south of Edom, and so on and so forth. And he, he talks about um, that, uh, obviously, Teman was Paran, and... Uh, most theologians believe that the prophet was thinking how God helped Israel exit from Egypt and that he, he would come and help, help Judah now. Well, he's going to help Judah, but he's, he still has to bring judgment because he, well, he's, he's already declared it. And he's going to bring judgment, and, he's gonna, and it's going to be horrible because that's, that's how far sin had taken uh, Judah. And, you know, preacher, I remember preaching years ago and hearing these old-time preachers, you know, now they, they, they would always get up and say, uh, you know, so I'm going to tell you right now, sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go. And it will, no matter how far you think you've gone and, and, and how much you think you've gotten away with it, you ain't gotten away with it. Sin, sin will take you to places you never dreamed you'd ever wind up. Even if, it's no, even if it's in your mind or in your heart and you just can't sleep nights and all that stuff. You know, sin, sin will take you there, and God will judge you. But then his mercy. Thank God, for, thank God in our case we have the cross and we have the Holy Spirit and so on. Okay, look, look at verse, um, oh, and then it says Selah. So that, there's that Selah again in verse 3 at, at the end of this verse. It, 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 it is a musical rest, but it is, it is a pause to think. You know, it's kind of funny, but I was thinking back, uh, it's either the hard shell Baptist, you know there's like a hundred different kind of Baptists. It's crazy. I looked in a phone book one time in the city I was in, and I was just looking, I was just looking, you know, it was a new place, and I was looking for Baptist churches, and I didn't see what they had. There, there was Baptists in general, and then there was like 47 subheadings of Baptists. Well, no wonder we can't get anything done. <laughs> we don't even know what we are among ourselves. You know, Southern Baptist, American Baptist, Northern Baptist, Hardshell Baptist, Primitive Baptist, um, uh, um, National Baptist. Oh, you you name it. There was something in there about a Baptist. Four four square Baptist was you know you a little more on the Pentecostal side, I think. But uh, uh, there, there's just there's just all kind of of uh, of bad. But there here he's he's uh, taking a he's taking a musical rest, and he's taking. Uh, thought to think about um, uh, what you're, what he's saying, what he's preaching about, what what he's singing, and, and it could he could have been singing. Oh, what, what I was saying was uh, some of these old time Baptists used to sing their messages. You, you ever know that? I was in church one time where they did. They get up and sing. Pretty neat. 
I'm going to try that. <laughs> I'm gonna try. Of course, you might be throwing song books at me by the time it's done. But they, they would literally get up and sing. And, and some, I think it was the Primitive Baptists, they would, they would get up and somebody's just, they, they just all gather in and somebody start preaching. And then when he's done, somebody else starts. You, you might have four or five sermons before they get out of there, you know. Thank God you're Southern Baptist. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Thank God you're, thank God you're Southern Baptist. Okay. Look, look at verse 4. His brightness was like the light he, he had raised flashing from his hand, and there his power was hidden. Um, God's glory is universal, folks. And this is what Habakkuk's seen. He, he, he's realizing that no matter what else is going on, God's still God. How bad things are here, God's still God. Uh, Joe Biden in the White House, God's still God. Um, uh, do we still do our best to be the right kind of citizen? Oh, absolutely, of course. And, and, and here we have the right to see what we want, and at least until this point. But whatever happens, whatever goes on, uh, please, and you all here, I'm sure know that. I don't have to explain anything because you're all theologians here. I know that. I've been around you enough. Bible people, thank the Lord. But I'm going to tell you something. As bad as it seems, and it is bad in some areas, God's still God. And we're still here, and we still have a job to do, and we need to do it for him. And that's, that's exactly what uh, um, I think Judah forgot. Circumstances look bad. People have been in bondage, blah, blah, blah. We're just going to do what we want. No. Uh, you, 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 you are going to have to deal with God at some point. You, you better be the right dealing at the right time, <laughs> or you'll deal with him when, when you don't, absolutely don't want to. Um, the, you know, the prophet said he looked up at the sun and saw the, uh, you know, the, the, those rays coming out. And it just I, I can just imagine him seeing the very arms and the power of God. And every time we look up to the sun and stars and all that, we need to understand the glory and power of God and get on our face for him and thank him for it and, and praise him for who he is. All right, look at verses uh, 5 and 6. Before him went pestilence and fever allowed at his, uh, followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth and looked startled at the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered and the perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. As God delivered Israel, he brought various pestilence to Egypt. Remember? It affected. And let me tell you something else. When, when he brought uh, the, uh, the death angel, that was over all the land. The firstborn of every whatever, would have been killed. But let me tell you something. That included Israel, except where the blood was. And the only thing they had to do was just follow God's direction. Folks, the only thing we have to do today is follow God's direction. If you're lost, you've got to be born again. You know, uh, they had to go out, kill a, you know, the right kind of lamb, the, 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 not, the, the pure lamb, uh, get, get the right kind of uh, uh, lamb's blood, put it on the lintel and on the doorpost, and uh, the death angel passed. But see, when we get in trouble, we forget to do what God's told us to do. And that's where Judah was here. It wasn't so much they forgot about what happened, but they just forgot God altogether. They, they weren't doing anything that God had instructed them to do, so they are paying a price for it. And judgment was, was getting ready to fall upon them. Um, if God did it once, the prophet was thinking, God can do it again. God can spare Judah at least some of them, some of the remnant. And that's what the Bible pretty much tells us, especially in Revelation. There will always be a remnant. Um, as bad as it's going to get under Antichrist, there's always going to be a remnant. And there's always going to be, uh, uh, there's always going to be his people. And thank God there's always going to be his church until he takes them out. Uh, he, he, it says he drove nations apart and defeated them. He separated them out for what they've done. And he's, God's a righteous God. So he's going to judge you for what you've done. And that's what these nations of this world today need to understand. Uh, no matter how the earth, listen, no matter how the earth reacts to, uh, to God's plan for the earth, his way will be accomplished because he is everlasting. He is God. Why do you say that? Because Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. So if... If God promised judgment back there, uh, the, God can promise judgment up here. If God brought judgment back there, God's going to bring judgment in, you know, in our day as well. And it, it may not be hordes of locusts. It may be all kinds of things, fires and pestilence and hurricanes. Who knows? 
what God's plan. I'm just saying. He, he, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's God. He doesn't change. James 1, 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God doesn't change. Understand, God doesn't change. We, we change a lot of things about Scripture. We, we change a lot of things about the book, uh, but God doesn't change. And we need to understand that. And we have a lot of uh, preachers preaching today that, well, you know, there might be another way, or uh, salvation is good for the Christian, or you know, Christianity is good for the Christian. Um, well, I got news for you. I don't care what you call yourself. Christianity is the only thing for you and for me. The only reason we, we, we believe it is because we've accepted it, and we, we hold on to that. But, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't make fun. I, don't, I, I just let people know you, you can do what you want legally in this country, but uh, spiritually and in, and in eternity, you're going to stand before God, and he's going to declare you condemned. The Bible says you're condemned already if you don't have Christ. And so... Um, that's what Judah was facing. They've been declared condemned. They, they did what they shouldn't have done. Uh, they, they refused God, and God's going to bring judgment. Um, at verse 8 and verse 7, he says, I saw the tents of Cushan um, in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian trembled. Uh, o Lord, you were displeased with the rivers. Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea? that you rode on your horses and your chariots of salvation. Your bow was made quite a quiet ready, a quite ready. Other oaths were sworn over your arrows, Selah. What's all that mean? What God did at the Red Sea, he can do any, anywhere. When, when he did with Israel, he can do anywhere. When um, uh, Joshua 3, 17, 15 through 17 reminds us that when Israel was crossing the Jordan into the promised land, that once again the Lord dammed up the water, and as the feet of the prophets uh, stepped on, you know, they were bearing the ark, and when they stepped in the Jordan, the waters receded, and they all crossed over on dry ground. Uh, God was and is in complete control of nature. He's in complete control of, of everything, and uh, we need to we need to just believe and, and walk with that. Does that mean we shouldn't try to change things? Of course not. He's given us this world to tend to, but um, don't ever make the mistake of thinking God's not involved. He's always involved. This is His creation. It's His world, and someday it'll be it'll be even better. Um, God uh, was and is in complete control. It talks about the horses and chariots of salvation mentioned here. That's, that's um, how God has watched over Israel. That's how he has kept them. It's not a physical thing here. It's just that he has, at times when it seemed like it was the worst, God showed up and brought them out or provided something. Um, I think, like I said, I think about the quail. You know, they, they were out in the middle of the, you know, the, walking four years, and, they, and you know, they started getting hungry. We want some meat along with this manna. He bring them a bunch of quail. And they had meat, and then they murmured about that. And, uh, you know, the manna was uh, like coriander seed, they said. And, in fact, they say it's still around today in Italy. You can still find what the Scripture declares. And I don't know that I've never had, quote, manna. But it was something sustaining, and it, it was something that all they had to do was go pick it up. You know, all they had to do was go out and get it. And uh, so God provided, and, and God's going to provide again. God's going but the the point to all this is, yeah, um, God God comes along and he's and Habakkuk is hoping that with the judgment that's coming, that mercy again, mercy would would also be intermingled there. Uh, he he knows they're going to take a hit. It's going to be horrible, but he also knows that God's not going to leave his people absolutely desolate, and he's praying for that, and he's praying for, um, and again he stops and pauses. To think about the power of God and, and, and the you know the same power that caused the waters to part, and in some cases the waters to gush forth is still the same God that that He's praying to and calling upon. Then look at verse ten, um, and then verse nine. Your your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrow, arrows. Um, 
someone said like this, God's power is open and can be seen by everyone. None understands his power better than those who have received a shot from his bow. <laughs> and uh, I think, I think uh, um, there's a lot of nations who think of Sodom and Gomorrah and others that this were so far beyond uh, this, the, the pale of decency of any standard God, uh, God destroyed and uh, they saw they, they, they felt the arrow of God coming down and look at what happened and uh, they dug up those areas and there's charred remains still to this day uh, because when God does something especially in, in judgment he, it'll be complete and let me tell you something else when God does something that's going to be a blessing I'm going to tell you right now it's, it's complete. Heaven's going to be wonderful. It's going to be absolutely, there, nothing can be added or taken away. I think the new heavens and the new earth are going to be wonderful. Nothing can be added or taken away because it's going to, when God does something, he does it complete. It, it'll be absolutely complete. Uh, let me get into, uh, I guess, verse 11 here, and, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for, the, for this uh, and give you time to pray and get in your groups and pray. Um, he says, the sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went, at the shining of your glittering spear. And continuing to um, extol God's abilities. Um, and, and in verse 10, I kind of overlooked that, but the, the prophet was talking about God is able to affect his will anywhere in creation as he did with the Noahic flood in which the mountains trembled, the waters were lifted up, you know, the waters gushed forth, his hands covered the earth and so forth. Look at what happened there. And it was just, it was just the power of God that did that. It rained, of course, but the waters gushed from the deep and filled the earth up above the mountaintops. Um, God's power is, is, you just can't, unless you've experienced it. And, uh, this uh, this prophet understood that, and he he knew what had under, what had gone on. But in continuing to extol God's abilities, the prophet speaks about how God stopped the sun. Remember when he stopped the sun for a whole day, as the children of Israel had revenge upon their enemies in Joshua ten, uh, twelve through fifteen. Um, not only is God powerful, or is God's power manifested throughout the world, but throughout the universe, God manipulated the natural orbit of the sun and moon. Uh, for the children of Israel. He did it once, and he can do it again. Isaiah 38 tells how God had sent Isaiah again to tell King Hezekiah to set his house in order because he was going to die and not live. Hezekiah prayed and asked the Lord to extend his life, so God promised that he would, and to prove that he was going to do what he said. Um, you can go back and look, look, look this up, but he would turn the sundial at Ahaz back 10 degrees. So now I'm not only, I mean, you can take my word for it, but I, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to turn the sundial back that had already passed a certain point. I'm going to put it back 10 degrees. And when they went and looked, it was back 10 degrees. So God, God is merciful, isn't he? He's a wonderful, powerful. We, need, we just need to get back to believing in the power of, of Almighty God and trusting in that, in that wonderful power. In uh, 2 Kings 6, where a man was using a, a borrowed axe head, uh, he dropped the axe head in the water. He cried for Elisha. The man of God came, and he threw a stick in the water, and the iron, and the iron uh, axe head floated to the surface. Folks, don't ever think God, here comes the rain, praise the Lord. Don't, don't ever think God can't manipulate, God can't do. We get so, I, I know, the years that I pastored, I used to wonder, and listen, I know, I've been in some, some of these fixes. Um, especially a pastor in smaller churches, but people come to me and just say, Pastor, man, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. Well, and, of course, we would try to help and, and help them to understand physical understanding of, of whatever situation they were in. But, but, but my question was always, have you been born again? Yeah. What brought you to that point? Well, I trust in God's ability to save me. Why? Well, because he went to the cross. Yeah, don't you think the same God who did that can take care of your problem? Now, you may have to work a little bit at it, and we'll get your people to help you. But before you die of despair, stop and think about who you're despairing against. It's God. 
Did you get yourself in this trouble? Well, sometimes people do, and they got to do. But sometimes you get in trouble and you don't have any control. Things happen. So what am I supposed to do? I've been faithful. I, I don't know how many people. Oh, Lord, I, I've been faithful. I've been faithful to my church. I tithe. I, you know, I, I, I love my church. I love God, and we're faithful here. We're you know, tell people about Jesus. Why would this happen to me? Well, I don't always have the answer to that, other than God's. And other people don't want to, well, don't ever tell them it's God's will. Well, what else do you tell them? God's in control. But I'm going to tell you something. God, if, if you're there, trust the fact that God has you there for a reason, and he's going to get you out or use you in some wonderful way. But don't, don't despair yourself to death. You know what? There, I have a message like most preachers do on anxiety out of, out of Philippians. And, you know, don't worry. Do you do you know what do you know what worry is really? Worry if if you're worrying about something down the road, worry is the interest you're paying on tomorrow's problems. And why in the world you want to pay interest on something you ain't got yet? Worry. I mean, I'm going to preach that sometimes. The whole uh, I'm preaching. It's, it's the only message I ever preach. If people ask for two or three copies. <laughs> I saw one lady years later, and she said, I still I get that out about every month and listen to that sermon. I said, well, you ought to be getting it <laughs> pretty much now. You know. But worry, worry, anxiety and worry is the interest you're paying on something that 99 and 44, 100 percent of the time never happens. And that's silly, but we all do it. Well, how do we turn that around? Remember who you're dealing with. That's easier said than done. It is because we don't study the book and stay in, on, in prayer and do the things we should do. Okay, enough sermonizing for tonight. Um, so I'll finish this in a couple of weeks. I'll come back and then we'll finish, finish up. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. And now we're going to have uh, all you at home. We, we're grateful you're here. Hope, you, hope you've been blessed. And again, if you have prayer requests and things, make sure you call the church. And uh, we'll, we'll sure pray uh, for your situation. And uh, I'm going to have prayer, and then you can break up into your, whatever groups you'd like. And and, uh, and you can tell the pastor I didn't keep you long <laughs> tonight. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for your, your love and grace. And Lord, it's not always easy to talk about punishment and judgment when it's fallen such a scale as we see here in Habakkuk. But, Father, I pray that we'd understand that you know, and we also see it, I believe, happening in our world today And uh, because we're just simply not. And I just pray, I pray for our nation for sure, and I pray for our president because we should. Uh, I pray that you give him wisdom that he can govern correctly. I pray for our governor and our mayors that they would govern correctly. But, Father, I pray for the church. Uh, your church, not just Beulah, and I do pray for Beulah, but I pray for your church that we would stand up and do the work you've called us to do, even though the circumstances around us look dim. You're greater than the dimness of this world. So we give you praise tonight. Bless the prayer time to follow, and we just want to give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.